Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome to the Baker Institute. Uh, we are gathered here at a time of increasing concern over the future of our nation's economic and fiscal viability and that of the global economy itself. I have many notes here to describe the problems we're facing, but I'm going to dispense with them completely to get to our keynote speaker. To get to me? Get to you, yes. <laughs> in, more, in, more, in, more, in more ways than one, Senator. <laughs> but I do like to say that the conference that started yesterday, the vigorous debate from our experts, uh, the very erudite and professional discussion that took place a place, I really believe, puts shame to the debate on the same issue that we see by our politicians in Washington. And I hope that what comes out of our deliberations will be some policy recommendations that will be viable, sustainable, and of use to our political uh, leaders. Uh, the Baker Institute did, uh, John Diamond and George Zodro, uh, our Baker Institute fellows, did. Uh, produce a report examining the conditions that led to the passage of the 1986 Tax Reform Act, which was the last major effort to update the U.S. tax system, income tax system. And John and George note that conditions are right for another sweeping reform of the tax system, and indeed the case for reform may be even stronger today than it was prior to the passage of the Tax Reform Act of 1986. Uh, I would like to recognize the Peter Peterson Foundation and Ernst & Young LLP for helping us underwrite this conference. We are grateful for their support. You have today's program uh, notes. Uh, you can see what the uh, panels will be in the deliberations. And uh, we are looking forward to a day of, uh, as I said, vigorous debate. Now it's my privilege to introduce our distinguished keynote speaker, a member of the Wyoming House of Representatives for over 10 years. He was elected as a United States Senator from Wyoming and served with distinction between 1979 and 1997. In the Senate, he was the Republican whip between 85 and 95 and chairman of the Senate Committee on Veteran Affairs. In 2010, as you all know, President Barack Obama created the National Commission on Fiscal Responsibility and Reform, which our speaker co-chaired with Erskine Bowles. The Commission produced a very timely and important plan to reduce long-term government debt by cutting expenditures, reforming the tax code, and raising revenues. Our speaker will have a great deal to say about our country's pressing fiscal problems, and we are truly delighted that he has taken time from his busy schedule to join us today. Allow me to say personally that <coughs> Senator <coughs> Simpson I believe, represents the very best in American politics. He is a man of great integrity, competence, common sense, and has something that is so rare in Washington, tremendous wit. In fact, uh, I asked my staff to give me some examples of his wit, but since this is being simultaneously webcast on the internet, I can't use them. <laughs> But there is one quote from a paper uh, quoting our distinguished speaker. Quote, former Wyoming Republican Senator Alan Simpson weighed in on the country's fiscal situation, saying that anyone calling for budget cuts that did not include Medicaid, Medicare, Social Security, and defense were, quote, issuing a sparrow's belch in the midst of a typhoon. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, join me in welcoming Senator Simpson. <clears throat> Ed, uh, of all the introductions I've ever had, that was the most recent. <laughs> no. <laughs> I, no. <laughs> well, I tell you, it is a treat to be here. And uh, Ed, uh, uh, Ann and I met Ed and, and Francois when he was ambassador to Syria. Boy, I tell you, where are you now when we, we need you? And People should be listening to this man. Whatever comes up about Syria, just go back to this wonderful gentleman. And so he is uh, indeed a skilled diplomat, a, a man of great reason and grace and intellect and professionalism, uh, uh, courage, persistence, the things you need. 
uh, and always a friend to his friends. And he's the real thing in every sense. And of course, Francois, a great lady and of her own right. So uh, my friend Baker is not here. He he felt guilty, and and indeed he should. Uh, he he said, "Al, I gotta go to Little Rock to take an honorarium." I said, "You cheap rotten." <laughs> and, uh, and so we did have dinner last night. And if you've met his wife Sue and my wife Anne, uh, then you know that we seriously overmarried in every sense. But. A very dear friend, very great friend, one of the most able men I ever met in public life. He'd done everything. I've watched him in many, many uh, venues as chief of staff, secretary of state, uh, co chair of the Iraq study group. That was five Republicans, five Democrats who agreed on every single word, every word, without, uh, you know, with a lot of scrapping, but we got there. And so, uh, I find him the dean of diplomacy. Uh, he's the old pro, and I've watched him. And I think he's one of America's finest, uh, finest people. In, and uh, so uh, it is nice to be here. And I'm going to scramble this up because I could see just in a few minutes that you're just lying in wait to ask questions, especially about what happened to my Social Security, for God's sake. <laughs> Well, how about my Medicare? What do I do without it? I said, yeah, go go get a heart operation for 150 grand. You don't even get a bill, so don't bitch to me. <laughs> I mean, we're in in stuff here. So, but first, uh, some wag asked me a question when I walked in here. I was flummoxed, taken aback would be another word. And I want to answer his question now. I didn't have the time at that moment. And the answer to his question is, yes, I did sleep in this suit. <laughs> And so, and uh, then, of course, uh, the quick story of the two guys in the penitentiary in another state, and one turned to the other, he said, the food was better here when you were governor. <laughs> but, but, <laughs> and, of course, the difference between a horse race and a political race, in a horse race, the entire horse runs. <laughs> And finally, in honor of my neighbor, Charles Duncan, uh, uh, by request, this quick Wyoming story, this couple hit the sack, three in the morning, phone ring, guy's answer says, how the hell do I know that's 2,000 miles from here? Hangs up. His wife said, who was it? He said, I don't know. He said, some nut called and asked if the coast was clear. <laughs> wow. One more quick testimonial, other than about Charles and Anne, is this dear Anne and John. I wandered into John about Mendelssohn 10 years ago. I said, I think I got prostate cancer. He said, better go on down here, and here I am. Let me tell you, what a place, M.D. Anderson, and what a, what a guy, and Anne. And, and to be a fellow here, that is a wonderful thing. Now, look, it's good to be out of the witness protection program from time to time, and, and for events like this. We say in Wyoming and Texas, if you hire on to be a cowboy, you can't bitch if you draw a buck and bronco. And let me tell you, this is a buck and bronco, this commission. Uh, and people say, why are you doing this? What they mean is, at this age, uh, uh, as Galbraith used to say, he was in his still years. Are you still riding? Are you still fishing? Are you still doing that? Anyway, uh, we thought we were doing it for our grandchildren, then suddenly we realize we're doing it for our children, and then we realize we're doing it for us. That's how close the pit and the pendulum comes. So Biden called, and he said, I got a real deal for you, Al. And this was in January 2010. I said, who's the co-chair? He said, Erskine Bowles. I got a quick call from Bob Dole and Elizabeth saying this is the finest man we've ever worked with. He, she beat him for the U.S. Senate. I said, I'm not doing this unless everything's on the table, so went right back to the president. Uh, it's been a very friendly atmosphere. Erskine is called a fake Democrat, a traitor to the Democrat cause. I've been called a Republican covering Obama's butt so that he can destroy the Republican Party. So it's just been a wonderful atmosphere to work in. <laughs> and, and, uh, so it took us three months to establish trust. 
coin of the realm in my time was trust. You shook hands. Uh, nowadays, that coin of trust is severely tarnished. If you can't learn how to compromise an issue without compromising yourself, you're doomed. You, you should not be in the legislature. Today, the word compromise means wimp. And that's a tough one. So for the first three months, here was the dialogue. Democrats. Who's the biggest spending president in the history of the U.S. before this guy? Answer, George W. Bush. Never vetoed a single spending bill in six and a half years. Not one. Gave us a pharmacy bill, no tax to pay for it, and fight two wars with no tax to support it. First time in the history of America we've had a war with no specific tax to support it, including the revolution. Well, that bitterness went on, and then, and then the, the, the Repub said, yeah, but this guy is four times worse. He's the monster, the stimulus, and on and on. Finally, Erskine and I said, we'll just do a two-person report. We're tired of this crap. And they said, well, well you wouldn't do that, would you? We said, yeah, we would, because we're tired. We're not, we're not interested in how we got here. It's what do we do now? And if you really want to know how we got here, and then you, this, this gets stirred up, because I'm going to cut this down so we can really chop around in it. We got here because you and the people of Wyoming and everybody sent people to Washington for 80 years to bring home the bacon. Go get the dam, go get the road, go get the veterans bill, go get this, get this, and if you didn't get this, you get out. Because somebody would run against you and say, this guy doesn't do anything for this district. I can go get this for you. So, the, the bring home the bacon is over because the pig is dead. And there's nothing to bring home out of this treasury. So anyway, and then we had the stereotyping. Let's see, Dr. No, is Coburn on that commission? God, he's a right-wing cuckoo, ain't he? And there's Andy Stern on that commission? Well, he's a commie, isn't he? I mean, you know, this is the stuff... You mention a name now, and you just immediately stereotype them as a, a, a quote, an ignorant Democrat or a stupid Republican. That's kind of sad. We had to work through that. People cry about the Defense Department. How can you do that? Well, we're going to do something with it because there's enough fat in there to last forever. You got. We said, how many contractors do you have? And they said, well, it's quite a range. It's between one million and ten million. We said, well, that's interesting. Uh, do you have any audit of that? No, we don't. We have no way to audit in, in, in the Defense Department. And then there are little things. Now, I'm a veteran. Don't throw anything. There, there is a thing called, there's a military retiree. That's 20 years. You can have 20 years. Now, that could be two years active duty, like me in Germany, some reserve time. And then if I'd stayed in the reserve, I'd have had 20 years. You can have National Guard time in there, and they have their own health care plan called TRICARE. And the premium is 470 bucks a year and no copay, and it takes care of all dependents, and it costs $53 billion a year. Try to mess with that? Ha, forget it, guys. Here comes the guys with the caps, and I'm one of them, VFW, American Legion. Enough of that. I don't want to get that out of there. Uh... All of us on the commission have had heat. Uh, we've all been the toast of the town one day and toast the next. Uh, well, as someone said, you're on the cover of time one year and six months later you're doing it. Uh, uh, but my old man ran for the Congress and uh, for uh, governor and U.S. Senate. He was campaigning one day and a guy hollered, Simpson, I wouldn't vote for you if Jesus, if you were Jesus Christ. The old man shot back. If I was Jesus Christ, you wouldn't be in my precinct. <laughs> so, so anyway, now, uh, so people said, well, we're going to cut waste, fraud, and abuse. That's what we're here for. I said, great. What is it? Well, waste, fraud, and abuse, all earmarks, Nancy Pelosi's aircraft, Air Force One, all congressional pensions, that'll get you about 4% of what you're looking for. So if you hear somebody get up and say, we can do this without touching, you know, I said, and Ed covered that and won't even go through it, but this is impossible. You can't do this without hitting the big four. So we don't use charts or PowerPoint and all that stuff. You just tell people if you spend more than you earn, you lose your butt. 
And then you tell them if you spend a buck and borrow 42 cents, you've got to be stupid. And that's your government today. Your government today is borrowing 42 cents of every buck they spend. And, uh, okay. and, and, and the reality of it is today, this day, your government is borrowing four trillion six hundred million bucks today and tomorrow and tomorrow all but borrowed borrowed not revenue raised somewhere that's today we had a report that's 67 pages long it's in english it wasn't written for pundits or peasants or or, or journalists or politicians it was written for the american people it uses words like going broke shared sacrifice I like that one. Mm -hmm. And everybody with skin in the game. The great escape hatch now is, boy, I'm ready to do something if everybody else will, and that's your escape hatch, because you know damn well that everybody else isn't going to do it, and you know that real, that's real. So anyway, uh, we have talked about tax reform, cut spending, uh, cut spending, cut spending, uh, uh, do broaden the base, raise the rates, get spending out of the code. And so we said, okay, we'll get rid of all tax expenditures. There's 180 of them in there. 180. And only 5% of the American people use them. The little guy has never heard of half of them. Oil and gas depletion allowance. How do you think that went over in Wyoming when I voted on this package? Mine land reclamation charitable giving, mortgage interest deduction, employer deduction of employee health care premiums. Try these things. You haven't seen anything yet until the first page, full page ads come out on every one of these and they're starting to roll out right now. So it has been an, a, a remarkable thing. Forget Buffett what he said because he was right. He said I pay less taxes than my secretary but you know he's in capital gains country not the big time, up to 38, 39, 37. So we got rid of all of those tax expenditures, and they came to a trillion, 100 billion a year. A year. That's the deficit this year, about one, four, something like that, and up, headed up. And we said, what do we do with the money? Well, you're going to use it on something else, that's all, so we can't do that. I said, no. We're going to use $100 billion to reduce the debt, and then we're going to lower the tax rate. We're going to say between 0 and 70 grand, you pay, you pay 8%. Between 70 grand and 210, you pay 14%. Everything over 210, you pay 23, and you lower the corporate rate to 26 from 36 and go to a territorial tax system. Oh, well, that, that sounds great. That's, that's wonderful. Well, it does until you're in it. We said, if you really want to do something for the little guy, don't forget who's being talked about day and night here, the little guy. The little guy. Mm -hmm. Well, we say, give the little guy 12.5% non-refundable tax credit on home mortgage interest deduction. And get it down to 500 grand instead of a million. Well, yeah, you could do that. And guess what? When the tipping point comes and the markets respond, and I don't know when that tipping point will come, but you can, we can talk about that. Who will be hurt the most when inflation starts up and interest rates the little guy? That's who's going to get hammered. The, rump, the money guys will always take care of themselves. Always. Because if you love money, you're going to figure it out, how to save it. And we have guys who sit at consoles and punch away on one-tenth of one percent of the currency of some foreign country and go home at night and make six grand. They don't give a rat's fanny about society or their fellow humans. This is the way it is. Now, I'm going to throw that away. If Ann were here, she'd, she'd throw, them, throw me out. Okay. Uh, we talked about firewalls. We talked about triggers. And here's what we did specifically. We reduced congressional and White House budgets by 15%, a three-year freeze on members' pay of Congress, three-year freeze on federal workers and Defense Department civilians, reduced the size of the federal workforce by attrition, 
sell excess federal property. There are 1.2 million buildings, structures, and land parcels. If you don't need them, peddle them. Bring military and civilian pensions in line with private pensions. Benefits, including mine. Protect the disadvantaged. Stabilize the debt. All you have to do is do a plan. We don't have a plan to do anything. Consider a temporary payroll tax holiday, which they've done and are going to do again. Well, what does that do to Social Security? If you give a federal tax holiday, you're just robbing a system which is going to be insolvent in 2036. So it uh, doesn't help that much. Uh, Health care is an absolute monster. There is no way. Call it Obamacare, Elvis Presley care. I don't care care. It can't work. Can't not work. And the reason? Well, grab a couple out of your common sense head. 10,000 people a day are turning 65. They're not all going to go in an alley and eat out of a garbage can, and you'd think they were. One person out of every three weighs more than the other one. you got pre-existing conditions, three years old and up. How, how much does that cost when you go through a pre-existing condition and you pay for it regardless of whether you want to or not? And you have longevity now, which is 78.1. Social Security was put on the books when the mortality was 63. That's why they set the retirement date at 65. If you were going to die at 63, then put the retirement date at 65, and your governor hit a nerve when he called it a Ponzi scheme. Because if you will look at it, it can't possibly exist. And I'll tell you why. It was never a retirement. Hadn't got a damn thing to do with retirement. It was an income supplement during the Depression. Had nothing to do with retirement. Had nothing to do with disability insurance, which was added to it. DI disability will be broke in six years. Gone. It will be gone. Unless, of course, the government pumps more money in it. Never intended to take care of students up to 22 years of age going to school. Not built for that. Not structurally there for it, and uh, there, and you're going to have to start. You're going to have to start affluence testing. You're going to have to increase co-pays. You have to reduce providers. You're going to look at physicians. You're going to look at lawyers and tort reform. Nobody, nobody is going to get out of the box if you're going to do this. And those things hit close. I have two sons who are trial lawyers. They said, Dad, Dad, what are you doing? I said, I've changed my mind. I'm not, I'm not with you anymore. <laughs> but uh, let's uh, let's honestly look at Social Security. I, I want to come back. I've had enough guff on that one to last the rest of my life. The most vicious emails and letters I get from people over 70. You son of a bitch. You rotten fink. You, I mean, you can't believe the gentility of 80-year-old coots sitting in front of... <laughs> In front of there, you know, just give them another, hit them again. Okay, here it is. They're hideous distortions. We're not, we're not balancing the budget on the backs of poor old seniors. That is a fake of the first order. Another unbelievable bit of babble. I think they called us the Cat Food Commission. That's a beautiful piece of jazz. We reform Social Security for its own sake. We messed with it for its own sake, not as part of the driver. And, and as I say, it's 63 when it was signed, the beginning of the game, and I say those things, we'll throw that out. Uh, how long do you think uh, it will last? Uh, anybody my age, 80, the first 40 years of my life, I never put in over 874 bucks a year, self-employed, and neither did anybody in the United States. Then it went to 1,200, then it went to 1,500, went to 2,000. I said, damn, my God, what is it? Went to 3,000, 4, and of course now it's out, out, out of sight. And then now that the Social Security Trust Fund has been stolen, that's beautiful. Usually there's violin music that accompanies that. Well, they took all the money out of there and just stole it. I'll tell you what they did with it. It said by law when it was set up that if there were cash reserves and those reserves were needed by the government, you would replace the money with gilt-edged, top-notch, you know, good forever, 
full faith and credit, bonds, treasuries, whatever, that's what's in there. And that if anybody ever needed some money to make up the gap, you just went to the government, they gave you the money. Well, in May of 2010, they didn't have enough to pay the next month. So they took the stuff, handed it to the government, got the money, paid it up, and that was that's a good thing. Except that doesn't appear in the debt. It's an intergovernmental transfer. It doesn't appear on the books. So uh, the gimmickry with that system through, as this gentleman said, through Lyndon Johnson and on through, but that system by actuarially unrefutable evidence in the year 2036, when you waddle up to the window, you'll get a check for 23% less without question if you do nothing. Apparently that's what the AARP would say, do nothing. We'll get it later. And they know what they have to do. You have to change the, the cost of living index to the chain CPI, which is realistic. And you have to change the retirement age to 68 by the year 2050. Now, when we said we were going to raise the retirement age to 68 by the year 2050, the AARP said, what a cruel thing to do to our seniors. Well, good God, you know. <laughs> tear, tear up your card. These people are not patriots. They're marketers. They have nothing to do with patriotism. If they did, they would help us. And they said, we will help you. Come back to us before you put out your report. And we went back and said, what do you got in mind? Well, a couple things. They wouldn't tell us what and still haven't. Of course, the day are, the chain CPI, and then raising the retirement age to 68 by the year 2050. And it will be, it will be 67 in the year 2027. Remember that. So there we get this business. And don't forget what happened here. In a year, that went from 2037 to 2036. Instead of 22%, went to 23 and that's what's going to happen every year. So what do we do? Didn't sound too smart, so what we said, well, let's, let's do something. Let's give the lowest 20% of people on Social Security 125% of poverty. That'll cost the system, but we'll, we'll, we'll buck that. We'll raise the older old from 80 to 85, give them another percent per year, a 5% lump or bump. Take care of the long-term disabled, and for the laborer, the guy who's exhausted, the hardship case will leave the retirement age just the same, no change. And, uh, and we will change the bend points, that's inside baseball, but it means the guy with more is going to pay more and the guy with less is going to pay less. It's all clear in there and I won't go into it, but we did these things to take care of the little guy. And we changed the wages subject to the tax to 190 grand instead of 106,800. Now, we did that over a course of years, and uh, there's lots more. Everything was on the table, uh, and as I say, oh, now finally, there's another little tipper in here, and that's Grover Norquist. Grover Norquist may be a good idea with a hell of a bad idea. Because Grover Norquist wandered the earth with his white-shirted minions 20 years ago and got everybody to sign a pledge that under no circumstances would they raise taxes under any circumstances whatsoever. Those were during the glory years. And he's using it like a hammer. And 95% uh, and of the Republicans have signed that baby. Go look at the remarks yesterday in the congressional record by Frank Wolf as to who Grover Norquist is, it'll chill you at what he's been up to in his life. But Grover is one tough cookie. He can't murder you. He can't burn your house. The only thing he can do to you is defeat you for re-election. And if that means more to you than your country in extremity, we ain't got a prayer. And let me just say it as clearly as I can. If we can't break the grip of the AARP, and Grover Norquist, uh, which there's a word that Lincoln used in most of his talks, many of them called enthrall. If we are enthrall to Grover and the AARP, you haven't got a prayer. Not a prayer of getting this done. Not one prayer. The tipping point, where is it? 
Erskine thinks it's, as Erskine says, we're the healthiest horse in the glue factory uh, when you consider other countries. Uh, but the trajectory of debt, deficit, and interest for us is the same as Portugal, Spain, Greece, Italy, so on, except the money is huge over here. So what do, what do we do? Where is the tipping point? Durbin kept asking this. Now, I tell people that Durbin voted for this commission report, and they say, well, Durbin, he's terrible. He, isn't he that Democrat from Illinois monster? See, that's where he are, and he's not a monster. He deserves the Medal of Honor because his leader was telling him not to vote for this, Harry. And Durbin did. He said, and he kept saying, where is the tipping point? Well, it's when, it's when nobody here in this room or me will know and doesn't have anything to do with reality. It's called when the market begins to respond to a dysfunctional government that cannot get anything done and may well not get anything done uh, in the latest caper. And at that point, bam, the interest begins to kick in and, and, the, and inflation, and we're off to the races. We will not disappear as a country. We just won't be the same country. Another thing I asked Grover, I said, uh, he said, my hero is Ronald Reagan. I said, great, he was one of mine too. He said, and that's it, that's where I'm coming from. I said, well, he raised taxes 11 times in eight years. Did you know that, Grover? He said, I didn't like that at all. <laughs> I said, I didn't ask you whether you liked it. I said, he did that. How did you feel? He said, I was terribly disappointed. I said, well, get, I said, he did it. What did he do it for? Well, he said, I don't know. I said, probably to make the country run. A sick idea for Grover. Uh, the president goes out, talks about bipartisanship, and then cuts guys like Paul Ryan to bits. And, and then does a fundraiser in L.A. and cuts the Republican Party to bits as if nobody in this electronic age could know what he said in a fundraiser in L.A. And they read it an hour later. It's very difficult. Uh, it's, it's an extraordinary thing. We can't get there without some revenue. We say get the revenue by getting rid of the tax expenditures. So Colburn puts in a bill to get rid of the six billion bucks for ethanol, and it passed. And Grover Norquist called that a tax increase. That is not only ludicrous; it's a lie. But if we can't get it out of tax expenditures, then obviously we're not going to get it out of additional tax. But here's the first non-PowerPoint presentation. This country right now is in revenue of 15% of GDP, which is the lowest since the Korean War. And historically, we've been at 19 to 20%. And we'll never get there while this country sinks uh, in, in this ideological uh, sump of Democrats and Republicans. But we have 32 Dems, 32 Republicans who said do something with tax reform and entitlements. You got new people in place. Uh, you got you got some real uh, efforts because they're pushed and deeply pushed right now to do something. And if they don't do it, then in January of 13 there will be a 600 billion dollar cut in defense and a 600 billion dollar cut in domestic a hammer, an axe, and the people of America will be totally offended by it because it's going to hit things with abandon. So people say, what should we do? And I said, well, I tell you, there's still something to do. Write your congressperson. And they say, I, that doesn't work. But I said, there's another thing. Go to the town meeting, and when they get up and say they can get this done, get up in the back and say, you, sir, or madam, are lying. Don't throw anything. Just say you're lying. You can't get there without hitting all of this. Well enough. I think I'll stop. Uh, I couldn't. I'm here thinking I think he should. He should stop. But uh, And, of course, the, the tough one was that Ed didn't go into, and I, I have had to clarify it. What I had to say was uh, every time in my office people would come in, they'd say, Al, cut the deficit. God almighty, we're proud of you. Jesus, get, get the handle on it. You're the only one here. I'd say, well, that's wonderful, makes your heart sing. And, and then they'd talk to you, and then they'd say, but Al, before we leave, we wanted to talk about a little change in the tax code. Uh, we have a change here, and we have a tariff here. This is not a tax. I knew I flunked that course in Laramie. 
And so all this stuff asking for more out of the Federal Treasury in a most subtle way with the best lobbyists you can buy. So I put a can of bag bomb on my desk. Sat there, a little green can, little blossoms. They said, what is that? I said, it's an emollient, a salve, if you will. What does it do? I said, well, you apply it to the extremities of the bovine members of the quadrupeds that issue lacteal extract. <laughs> oh, well, that's smart ass. Is that... So I said, well, what? what? They said, well, I don't get it. I said, look, the sun shines on the snow, bounces off the snow onto the udder, cracks the udder, chafes it, rub bag bomb on there. The calf comes to nurse. Everything returns to bucolic splendor. And they said, well, what's it, why is it on your desk? I said, ah, if America's become a milk cow with 310 million tits, we need all the bag bomb we can produce. <laughs> and I have said that for 25 years, but they've picked it up and made it a terrible negative, but I love it anyway. I don't do <laughs> Enough. Uh, so fire away anything, anything about anything, personal, public, private, whatever the hell you got in mind. Anything at all? Whoop. We will retrieve your watch. Well, I hope so. <laughs> okay, we're open for. I'll uh, get my questions. notes here. Yeah. Uh, Senator, it, it seems that everything that you suggested in that commission has been totally ignored by the administration, and it just hadn't been picked up at all. Am I wrong about that, or? The, uh, the president ignored it because he knew that he would be torn to bits if he did. Ryan had the guts to look at everything we did. He was on the commission. He said, the big problem is Medicare. It's unsustainable. It can't work. It, it's, it's, it's just we're fooling the world. So he did his package, and he knew that he would get ripped to shreds, which he was ripped to shreds. But he was on the edges of... You know, somebody's got to pay for this. you got to do the affluence testing. you got to do the vouchers. And uh, j just put it this way. Uh, this commission, and, I, and Erskine and I are visiting with each of the 12, the super commission, uh, and they are asking us our thoughts. We're not there to say our, pro our proposal is the best. We just say, can we help you? I've talked to John Kerry. You see, now, if you say you've talked to John Kerry, if you've talked to John Kerry, that rotten stuff, you know, I mean, you know, this is where we are. Or you talk to Coburn, oh, God, you know. So Kerry says he wants to make something work. He's a very reasonable guy. I've known him a long time, trusted him, didn't agree with him. You got, you got uh, Rob Portman of, of Ohio. He's a solid member of this. If... if Portman and Kerry can begin to pull. Don't forget, they don't need 60% of the vote in this baby. They need, you know, one over, you know, they need seven, which is good. John Kyle has been totally obstructive, Republican from Arizona. He said if there's any kind of revenue in there, he'll have to walk out. Well, that's not a very good way to start. Javier Becerra, Democrat in California, he's listening. He's very liberal, but he listens. And you got Max Baucus, says he wants to do something, but he didn't help us on the commission, but he says he's ready to go now. That's great. I believe him. So we're talking with him. I'll talk to Camp today and Patty Murray and Erskine sees him. And they're caught. There's nowhere to go. There's no need for any more hearings because the actuaries reported to us, and we took all their stuff. Then you had the Gang of Six, which became the Gang of Eight, four Republicans, four Democrats. Then you had Domenici and Rivlin, Alice and Pete, and their proposal, and Bull Simpson. It's all there. There's no need to, you can't go get any more evidence. You don't, there's nothing to get. So, they, interestingly enough, are coming back to this, this theme which is the only one that was the reason that we weren't accepted is we were specific. Once you get specific, the full-page ads from Lockheed, the full-page ads from the National Association of Realtors, the full-page ads from the AARP, the mailings begin and the hammering starts. And that's what's going on in America right now. So... Uh, 
Uh, they have nothing more to work with than the basis of what was worked on for a year and a half by good faith Republicans and Democrats. So we'll see what happens. But it didn't go away. What was the content of the grand bargain that between Boehner and the president that never really was uh, <laughs> discussed in, in detail? And how close did they really come to doing something? My understanding of the grand bargain was that Boehner said something to the effect he didn't come to Congress to go out just having been beat to death by the lobbyists and the constituent groups that he wanted to do something big. And to do something big, he wanted to do four trillion bucks over ten years and hit into these systems and, and take some of the recommendations of Rivlin, Domenici, uh, uh, and all of the rest. And, and he came back to his caucus, and don't forget, his, his lieutenant, his assistant, walked out to the media, and they said, why did you leave uh, Representative Cantor? Well, they began to talk about revenue in there, and I, I left. Now, uh, I tell you, if I'd done that to Bob Dole as his assistant for 10 years, I would be too embarrassed to speak to him again, because all it did was leave Bamer in the room looking like a guy who was looking for tax increases while Cantor's covering his fanny outside. That is the kind of stuff that's going on. Cantor may be something from Macbeth, uh, waiting with a dagger under his... Well, well enough of that. <laughs> but anyway, uh, he and he and Bamer now show up together and say they're in, in complete accord, but there's lots of lots of internal... And you've got the Tea Party guys who say, we don't care about the debt. The debt means nothing. It's just a fiction. And then you had Michelle Bachman saying, you know, just forget the debt, just pay the interest. Well, that really is one of the most beautiful statements. <laughs> the interest is about $600 billion right now. And, and, you know, there are people who really want the government to fail. Uh, Grover said, I want to drown it in the bathtub. That was his comment years ago, and he may... He may get her done. But that was his statement. That Grover said, we're going to take government, drain it, drown the baby in the bathtub. And uh, that's your patriotic Grover Norquist. But read the congressional record yesterday. They begin to put the heat on that cap. Yes? Yes? I wanted to say thank you for the presentation and for your service. You mentioned at the beginning that everyone needed to have some skin in the game. And then you mentioned the three tax rates. Does that mean that the significant number of people who are no, not paying personal income taxes now would then begin to contribute, albeit at a low level? Well, when you go from zero to 70 and you're in 8%, I mean, but you've gotten rid of all the things that are able to fund that. And we think that if you do that, you that you'll come to an atmosphere of job creation and, and no, con, no more confusion. But... Yes, 48% of the people of America pay no, no income tax. They pay other taxes. Uh, we even suggested that if you went to a doctor's office, you laid five bucks in cash on the table, regardless of who you were or what your status in life, to make people know that you were in a country where for five bucks you're going to get the best care in the world. And that was quickly savaged as being a cruel thing to do with little people. It's less than a pack of cigarettes and a movie ticket, but, you know. And then we have the lifestyle of people who choose to be obese, choose to be, choose to do booze, choose to do tobacco, choose to do that, choose to do designer drugs, and all of those people are going to be in this, quote, magnificent Medicare health care system. This is absurd, and you don't need a chart to know what's, what's happening. But uh, didn't answer your question, but I got a lot off my chest on that. <laughs> uh, what the hell? Uh, Be careful, Francois has a question. Francois. Yes, uh, my question is, when uh, the president uh, let you know that he was behind, that he was on board for your mission? I'll repeat that. Go ahead, Francois. No, when the president... Okay. Yes, mm -hmm. when he indicated that he was on board, mm -hmm. Do you think he felt that he had the political capital? He must have known 
what you would recommend to some extent. And do you think that he felt he had the political capital to, to adopt his recommendations, and that it would alter his mandate or maybe uh, extend it? Francois was asking if when we went and said it's everything on the table, did he realize that, you know, what might be, or did he, was he authentic in, in saying everything was on the table and so on? And he was. He brought the whole commission into the Roosevelt Room, said, I'm, I'm ready to do this. But don't forget what he did. This is one clever cat. He made that speech at George Washington the day he hammered uh, Ryan and the Republicans. Hammered, would be word. I said, I told the president, it's like inviting a guy to his own hanging. He didn't like that at all, but I told him that anyway. You have to be frank with him. It doesn't matter who's your president. They're not there to be just hang around him as a sycophant. Uh, anyway, don't forget what he did there. He asked for a $4 trillion removal deficit reduction in 12 years. He covered himself right now so that if it comes up later, they'll say, well, where were you, Mr. President? He said, you know where I was. I said, I wanted to get $4 trillion in 12 years. Erskine and Al wanted to get $4 trillion in 10 years. Didn't tell you how to get there, of course. And if he had done that a year ago, before that, his base would have torn him to shreds. And over that course of that year, he got himself up to $4 trillion bucks and applause by saying they'll never cut this, not on my watch. It was almost like a triggered response from the audience, something about what Ryan had suggested. But so, uh, you know, he's in a total re-election mode. Uh, this isn't there isn't any other thing that's guiding him right now but how to get re-elected. And then there's nothing guiding McConnell in how to defeat him for re-election. And that's your government right now. Totally dysfunctional. Yes. Senator Simpson, <coughs> excuse me. A lot of what you say makes sense. Uh, pardon my allergies. No, no. Uh, but with all due respect, as a small businessman, I'd like to point out what I think is a flaw in the discussion. When you set me up for a tax increase by bemoaning the fact that our taxes are only 15% of GDP, um, that's not the only load we have to carry courtesy of the federal government. I've got a minimum wage I've got to pay if I want to hire somebody. I can't base when I pay somebody based on what he will produce for me. I have a law that tells me that I have to do that. Uh, I also have the uh, Environmental <coughs> Protection Agency. I have the Americans with Disabilities Act. I have state and local governments that have their mandates that they have to pass. You know, here in Texas, we have skyrocketing school taxes, etc., on the properties. And so while 15% is no doubt the figure, it's not the entire load that we employers have to carry in order to help you solve your problem of revenue by hiring people. Yeah, well, uh, our, I just gave you the figure of 15% GDP, and it's historically been 19 to 20, and we have said not one thing about, quote, raising taxes. We're talking about getting rid of the tax expenditures which are nothing more than tax earmarks, which are nothing more than spending under the tax code, and that that then gets your money. And Grover calls that a tax increase, which is deceptive. But I'm not talking about going out and, you know, and, and we're talking about giving people 0 to 70, you know, 8%, and we're talking about getting rid of $1 trillion we were stunned. One trillion, one hundred billion in tax expenditures, which is how we would get the revenue. Well, I also would argue that those tax expenditures introduced distortions in the economy that cost us more than just the amount that comes out of the computer. You're absolutely correct. Totally. Yes, sir. Senator, do you think the committee is actually going to come up with a proposal or even if they do, that by default it's going to just going to have the two wax to the budget, six hundred billion dollars. I, I I don't know. I, I uh, six months ago I thought they might get there, but after talking with them, uh, and and knowing what's happening now with the advertising going on in America and in the magazines that they read in Washington, the Hill, Political, Roll Call, National Journal, the ads are now filling up with people lying on a gurney 
if you're going to cut, remember what who's going to be cut. And here's this beautiful woman lying there on a gurney. She's going to make it. She's only 28. She looks like she could. Not some old coot. And... Uh, and the ads are starting, whatever happened to everyone having a home, we know that there were mistakes before, but we've corrected that. And, uh, and uh, defense contractors showing airplanes made out of dollars, saying we can save money, we're not here to, to build the new engine for the aircraft but we can save you 36 billion if you build this engine over this engine. And don't forget in the defense department when you have a weapons system Pieces of it are made in all 50 states. There's a reason for that. That's when it comes up for a cut. They say, do you realize we make the, the left aileron in Cheyenne? And that means jobs in Cheyenne, so don't touch that. And that's, that's the defense budget, very cleverly. And Eisenhower warned of it. He said, watch out for the military-industrial complex. And boy, they are in full sway right now. Yes? Senator Simpson, uh, uh, do you think there are any Republican candidates that are willing to make the hard choices? Do I think there are any Republican candidates ready to make the hard choices? One just dropped out, and that's Christie. He, he, would, have, he would have said it. But of course, when he, if he got in at this stage, the others would have just, they would have gone back and found out that he had actually shot a mailbox back in 19... <laughs> and, uh, of course, with me, I came right out with that early. I, I said I was on federal probation for two years for shooting mailboxes. <laughs> and then slugged a cop in Laramie, you know, and went to the clink. So you get that, get that stuff out early, and then the media can't clobber you when you get in. But they would have, they would have savaged him. But I tell you, the most... And I use the word disgusting. They were all there on the stage. And the moderator said, if we were to get $9 of spending cuts and had $1 of revenue, would you vote for it? And all nine of them shot up no. All nine of them. Now that is absolutely an abrogation of not just leadership, but it's pandering, pandering, pandering. And it works. Obviously it works. And I couldn't believe that one. I don't know. I don't think any of them uh, watch the debates. Uh, Michelle Bachman apparently is slipping. Her staff is leaving and so on. And uh, I don't know. Palin now says she's not in, which is good. And Christie is in and not in, and which is bad. But I, uh, I don't know. All I know is uh, watch the debates. Uh, the only one I, and I haven't endorsed anyone, uh, I, I do know Romney. Uh, when I was at Harvard, I taught at Harvard. I couldn't have got into Harvard if I'd picked the locks. <laughs> but uh, I was there, and I had an afternoon with Romney and his wife, along with Kitty and Michael Dukakis, the six of us, at lunch. Very interesting. He's done some things. I mean, he is a record of taking over a system that was totally... Uh, in chaos, the Olympics. He has, he knows what business is, and I think he's steady. Um, and it, I forget the issue of Mormons. I don't think that's really an issue any more than Kennedy is a Catholic. That didn't. You just d go directly to that and confront it. But uh, uh, I don't know. This guy Cain seems to pick up a lot of stuff. Very able. Very articulate. Except when you ask him about foreign policy, he said, That's, we, we don't talk about that. Well, somebody has to talk about it. And uh, anyway, or people who say, uh, just stick with America. Just don't j ignore what's going on overseas with these other countries. That's not us. Well, unfortunately, everything we do is interconnected. Everything, every day. And our German friends with this fine council here are going to get tired of being the milk cow. And I think that's going to be very real, and so is France. And uh, and at some point, uh, and you talk about the things I'm talking about, 
the same reaction will come in America that is in Greece. The veterans will be in the street. The old folks will be in the street. Don't forget, we did a catastrophic health bill in the 80s, which was powerfully good, except it hit the top 5%, about 1500 bucks a year. And we repealed it after they tipped over Danny Rostenkowski's car, a deceptively frail group of seniors. <laughs> tipped over his car, and, and we didn't have the guts. I didn't vote to repeal it. I said, wait a minute, it had hospice care, it had not paying over 600 bucks a year for pharmacy, and 85% and of the American people would have had to pay 7 to 10 bucks more a month, and the top guys would have had to pay, and I got the most vicious letters from the richest people in the gated communities of Sun City and Florida that you have ever read. Last question. Last question. Hell, I wanted to get it. I want my watch. <laughs> if I may ask two points. Anything. One is, how, how is this whole issue complicated by the fact that we're in a major economic recession? And secondly, uh, you mentioned the power and growing power of lobbyists. Do you have any suggestions how, even though lobbying is a major part of America's right to contact their congressmen, how we can relook or readdress this whole issue of lobbying? Well, I'm on a group, uh, Bill Bradley and I, uh, and uh, Warren Rudman and Bob Carey are on an a organization called The Common Good. Uh, well, I, that's the common, the common good is about tort reform. I, I separate it. The other one is Americans for Campaign Reform, Campaign Finance Reform. Uh, it's really not so much lobbyists as, as, you know, grassroots and so on. It's the influence of money in politics and what's happening right now and all of you have been in it in one way or another what's happening now is the guys who who put the primary money in 10 15 years ago said we we maxed out for you in your primary and we maxed out for you in the general and we did that every year and we're so proud of you and we've never really asked anything of you you have to on that right, you never have. And they're in there now saying, now, pal, we're here to really talk Turkey. You can't let this happen to us. And that is, that's the, that's the horror of politics now. It's the money. And now a Supreme Court decision which says that a corporation is a person under the First Amendment. And the Republicans were just tickled to death about that. Well, I'll tell you, so is Andy Stern. So Andy the other day he said, "You think this is just for the Republicans?" He said, "Wait till we finish wiping the wiping the floor with these guys, because the union guys are now pouring the bucks in, as if as if it was just a, a Republican caper. It's it's a destructive caper. I can't believe that the court would say that a corporation is a person under the First Amendment, but they did. Anyway, the lobbyists, uh, you you pay for what you get, and they make." They make a lot of bucks, and they used to go to the finance committee and work on Russell Long and Bob Dole, and and now they uh, they they're still at it. But uh, it is uh, it is uh, it it's it, you can't really say that somebody's just uh, uh, grassroots, you know, lobbying when when they're out to do something which is simply to get something more into the tax expenditure column. And that's what these lobbyists have done, to get more into the tax expenditure column, to reduce the rate of their payment under certain business. There are things in there like Blue Cross, Blue Shield, the life insurance industry. I mean, get serious. Go look at the 180 of those babies, and they've started their advertising that you can't do this. So it's... Uh, I don't know. I'm, a, I'm an optimist, but yet uh, the country isn't going to disappear, but it's not going to be the same country. When the, when the markets respond and inflation and interest starts up, the irony of hurting the little people in the face of the guys who are saving those tax expenditures when only 5% of the American public are using them. That is, no wonder they're out in the street, in Wall Street, they don't know why, but they know that, that something is askew in America. 
and nine million people not working and as I say, guys, just, you know, not paying attention, telling people well, if it weren't for us on Wall Street, you'd be picking grit with the chickens. And that's, that's an arrogant, a cruel thing to tell the American people in these times. Well, now I have a quick... Are you trying to cut me off? <laughs> no, no, this is very, very sudden here. This is the last... Comp and you, I'll stick around. Let me tell you what I think, just very quick, two minutes. I think it's my view very clear now after doing a lot of stuff for this country as an American, not as a Democrat or Republican. I frankly never gave a damn. They would say, well, now, Simpson, we have a platform and you're not following it. I said, I know, I didn't write it. I didn't have a thing to do with it. I didn't sit up all night changing the to as, you know, and all those things you do in a convention. I have deep personal views. I shared these same views when I was in Congress. Abortion. Who the hell's for abortion? Abortion is a hideous thing. I don't see anybody running around with a sign that says have an abortion, but I'll tell you, abortion is a deeply intimate and personal decision. And I don't think men legislators should even vote on it. I don't throw anything. I'm not through. No, no nobody ever claps when I speak. Uh, Homosexuality. What the hell is that all about? There isn't one of us doesn't have someone we know or love or related to that isn't gay or lesbian. I had a cousin who was won the Silver Star in World War II who was gay. What the hell is that about? So you have a party of homophobes, or l largely. You forget gay marriage, but it should be no special privileges, no special penalties. Do whatever you want to do. And I'll tell you, it's something to watch. And here's a party that on everything it says, we value government out of our lives, the precious right of privacy, and the right to be left alone. Well, if that's the case, this is raw hypocrisy, and that's why people aren't buying it. And if we stay away from that, like the governor's race in Virginia and Christie, they got elected. They didn't come out and play in the social muck of a party that should be out of your, your life, get out of your life. So, those are things that I, that I see, but I, I just think we forget too much. I think we forget our greatness. I think we forget our role in the world. I think we forget oh, so many things and, and, and yet not be arrogant. We forget we're the only nation on earth founded with a belief in God. Whether you like that or not isn't the issue. That's the way it was. That's the history of America. They were fleeing religious persecution. I think we forget our strengths. We forget our blessings. We forget our room for the things we did and our roots of escaping religious tyranny. As I say, we forget we were one of the first countries on earth to free the slaves. The first one was the Soviet Union. Interestingly enough, we don't go into that, of course. The serfs, we don't touch that. I just think we should treat ourselves with a lighter hand and be tender with each other. And remember, too, we must be a pretty good country or else why would everybody in the world be trying to get here? And I think we should be proud of our heritage and our generosity and our hospitality and our diversity. And as civil wars tear at the throats of other countries, remember we had one, too, brother against brother. And in five days of that five Aprils, we lost more people than all the lengthy horror, horror of Vietnam. 650,000 young men, mostly men, in the Civil War. And I think we should be slow to judge others, give advice, swift to defend the weak, steady in our resolve to combat evil, and ready at all times and places to speak well of a rather remarkable experiment called America. I thank you very much.